What's wrong, beaver? Wolves are eating up all of my friends. Humans also hunt us because we sometimes destroy property and they want to use our fur. Not cool, man. Our practices bolster ecosystems when we build dams because we're able to keep water above and below ground, create habitat for tons of species, and form barriers to forest fires. Oh yeah? Beavers are getting in our way for returning to our historic range and getting all the special treatment from humans in conservation. Who cares? They play with twigs all day. And do not even get me started on humans because they are the reason that we are no longer found in most of our historic range. If anybody deserves an apology, it's the wolves. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Humans have done plenty to protect the beaver and conserve the wolf. What my species needs to focus on now is each other. We can not even agree on how best to protect each of you without disagreeing about silly stuff. What we humans need is to build better relationships with each other, and we need a neutral meeting spot to do so. Oh, come on. Uh, cut. Can we try that conversation again? And this time use a little bit of that deliberative democracy we've learned about. And how about a little more empathy this time? I guess I really don't go out of my way to help either of you, but I'll continue to survive and thrive so that you can too. I guess people could learn a thing or two about coexisting from the beaver and the wolf. I'll be sure to consider both of your perspectives so we can create better policy for everyone. I can live amongst you both, keeping the ecosystem in check through predation so that both of you can thrive. Much like how our first conversation went, these topics are often full of controversy and misunderstanding in real world application. Our three projects work to make these types of conversations easier through community engagement as a source of power for all to move forward into action. While all three are different, the message is the same. Environmental issues need to be collaborative and utilize storytelling and educational tools to their fullest potential. Starting us off, Heather will tell us about the work she's done to conserve the beaver and often forgotten about keystone species in the Gunnison Valley. In recent years, beavers have been seen as a tool to fight against climate change due to the benefits their dams provide in watershed restoration projects. Janaya will present next on her project that explains the spiritual connection with nature here in Gunnison in comparison with our sister city, Majakali, India, and how perhaps that spiritual co connection might be used to encourage sustainable interfaith and in, uh, initiatives in a community. Eileen spent her project hours creating a deliberative democracy forum to bring stakeholders together regarding the 2020 Colorado Wolf Reintroduction Project. Being one of the most prevalent and controversial issues on the Colorado landscape at this point in time, this project hopes to bring about higher educational resources and collaboration to the stakeholders of Colorado as the wolf is returned to the centennial state. I think the clicker works today. Awesome. All right. So my project is scientific communication, the tales of the American beaver and Gunnison sage grouse. All right. Five years ago, little freshman me shown up to Western as an environment and sustainability major. I was excited about a degree that would allow me to play outside and consider that classwork. I could run around rivers, play in snow, go for hikes, collect soil samples, and professors graded me on it. I was excited about getting an immersive environmental and scientific degree. What I wasn't expecting was the amount of emphasis this degree placed on communication. I'm an introvert. Anyone who knows me knows that. What I specifically did not pick was communication project for that reason. Uh, I soon realized just how much the environment and sustainability degree focused on communications and ethics over science. Did I finish it? Yes, I did. Did I stay for the master's in environmental program? Obviously. Um, did I try to switch the MS in ecology program? 
I did. Uh, that didn't work out for me either. I wanted more science in my life, so I chose a scientific project working on mine reclamation. Obviously, that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Um, due to COVID, I had to walk away from that project. Okay, so after hearing all that and in the introduction we gave as a panel, what do you think my master's project is? That's right, communication piece. That sounds like I'm not grateful for my time in the MEM. That was not my intention. I'm absolutely grateful for all the experiences, skills, and perspectives I gained from being in this program. I believe the focus on communication and ethics really pushed me out of my comfort zone and made me a better candidate for natural resource management. After walking away from my original project, I had to rethink my whole MEM project. It was January of this year that I had to restart, so I had to find something that I could finish in four months that would also leave behind a beneficial project. Dr. Young took over as my advisor when I walked away from my original project and asked me what would help me the most when looking for a future career. What was I interested in? What skills did I need to reach requirements for job applications? And what did I most want to learn? I want a career working in water. So that's what I told her. Uh, as most of you know, a lot of the fun field work doesn't happen in winter. So there weren't many options there. But I can find a project inadvertently deals with water. That project process led me to Dr. Russell due to his background in watershed restoration. From there, I connected with Ashley Hom at the US Forest Service. She had just come off a of field season utilizing some newer and unique watershed restoration methods. Hi. Right. So my project focused on creating educational and engaging materials to highlight two controversial species in the Gunnison Valley, the American beaver and the Gunnison sage grouse. I learned how to create a website, story map, and manual to tell the story of these creatures educate the public on why they're important to our valley and identify key opportunities for community members to be involved in their survival. The largest portion of this project focuses on beavers. A new movement is forming in the water restoration world and the answer to our problems are beavers. No longer are beavers cute and cuddly water dwellers. They are 40 to 60 pound ecosystem engineers revitalizing the aquatic resources in the arid west. A group deemed the beaver believers are encouraging communities, especially skeptical ranchers and farmers, to believe in the power that beavers possess over aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. They want everyone to see beavers as amazing creatures that change landscapes, raise water tables, and create buffers to forest fires. Our local Gunnison Valley Beaver Believer Group wanted a communication piece that would highlight the work being done utilizing beavers and beaver-inspired restoration methods around the Gunnison Valley. This work includes the installation of beaver dam analogs to mimic the function natural beaver dams would provide in slowing and spreading water across the landscape, as well as other low-tech process-based restorations on perennial and often free-flowing systems. There has been a great amount of discussion on wet meadow restoration in the valley, but the Gunnison Valley beaver believers want to separate their work from wet meadows. Though the processes are essentially similar, the systems the separate groups work on have different hydrologic capacities and functions on the landscape. As Ashley likes to say, the work done by the beaver believers is essentially wet meadow work, just wetter. We discussed pamphlets, signage, seminars, and website platforms to determine the best educational route that would reach the widest audience. For the amount of time I had for the project, we decided I'd make an educational website that'd be a collaborative forum for all things beaver and gunnison. So those are some screenshots from the website. Uh, my main deliverable for this project was the creation of content and layout for the Gunnison Valley Beaver Believer Group's website. The website highlights all the partners involved in low-tech process-based restoration, specifically those related to beaver-inspired restoration work in the Gunnison Valley. I conducted interviews with some of the more involved and top contributors to this work. I wanted to highlight the reason these groups are interested in beaver-related restoration work, showcase some of the restoration projects they're involved with, and give space to their visions and hopes for the future. The website also provides basic information on beavers, the many benefits they provide to ecosystems, including sections on recreation and natural hazard mitigation, relocation permitting and considerations, and provides space for specific projects in the valley to be highlighted, including a detailed section on one of the first large-scale restoration projects the beaver believers were involved in on Trail Creek and Taylor Park. The website is a collection of resources and extra links users can explore on top of the written compilation of information highlighted on the website itself. I was also tasked with researching best practices for website design. 
Anyone can use a free platform to create a website, but we wanted the work to be as professional as work being done on the ground. <laughs> I created a manual highlighting the research I did on website development and how that would translate to the Beaver Believer's desire to educate the public. In the manual, I also included an extra feature section with recommendations tailored to the Beaver Believer group and the audience they want to reach, including English to Spanish translation, mobile-friendly translation, and a suggestion for an interactive map of restoration sites in the future. As I mentioned before, I had the opportunity to not only tell the story of the beavers, but also the story of the Gunnison sage grouse. I'm assuming a few of you may know that just Dr. Jessica Young was instrumental in setting the Gunnison sage grouse apart from the greater sage grouse through her research endeavors. In the years since the Gunnison sage grouse gained its independence from the greater sage grouse, Studies have shown increased losses in populations around the Gunnison Basin. To highlight the importance of conserving the sagebrush ecosystem and providing suitable lecking grounds for these birds, Dr. Young enlisted the help of her EMBS 611 students. These students created a story map about the Gunnison sage grouse's past, present, and future. A story map is a function provided in ArcGIS that allows users to share the stories and context of the maps they created using text, photos, media, links, and other multimedia. It's kind of like a PowerPoint presentation in the form of a longer article. The ENVS 611 class learned how to conduct interviews with local stakeholders, how to compile a vast list of educational resources, such as articles, scientific papers, videos, and graphics, as well as how to create a compelling story to gain support for a disappearing species. They presented their story map to a group of public land managers, as well as other 611 students, and gained feedback on what they did well and what could use a little work. I utilized the feedback as well as direction from Dr. Young to take the story map to the next level with the help of Alyssa Warsham. We reimagined the story of the Gunnison sage grouse using all the great information collected by the 611 students. An update email about the Gunnison sage grouse summit was sent out earlier this week. I'm sure most, if not all of you received that. Uh, the story map I just told you about is linked in that email. And it's also on the Center for Public Lands website. Um, though I loved working on these projects and I feel I laid a decent foundation, there are always ways of improvement. The story of the Gunnison Valley Beaver Believers has just begun, and they'll have tons of opportunities for communication, peace, and other multimedia projects for future students. The website I've created is just a skeleton at this point. There are opportunities for more research and website development before that site is ready to be launched. That would include collaborating with partners in the Valley, possibly conducting more interviews with those partners, taking part in the continued restoration work on Trail 3, possible involvement in restoration work on other sites in the Valley, and the opportunity to tell the story of any and all additional restoration utilizing Beaver-inspired tactics. Away from this website, there are tons of other multimedia options, including educational signage placed in Taylor Park, telling the story of how the watershed has changed over years, and how the restoration work hopes to create a system that resembles the area prior to human influence. That project would specifically look at the difference in aerial imagery from the 1950s to 1970s in comparison to now, as well as gaining a native perspective on what the land used to look like for mute tribal members. Those are only some of the options I've talked with Ashley about when considering what I could accomplish in my time. There are definitely an abundance of opportunities to get involved with the Gunnison Valley Beaver Believers as they establish themselves more in the community and on the land in the future. Now that I've shared some ideas of where this project can be taken in the future, I wanna thank all the people who are willing to help me in my master's journey, especially those who are willing to get me to the finish line on such an accelerated timeline. I wanna thank Jenny DeMarco, Dr. Jenny DeMarco, uh, firstly, because she was the advisor on my original project. She was instrumental in leading me through writing my first grants, gaining funding for my project, and teaching me the nitty gritty of scientific research and planning. I also want to thank Dr. Jessica Young for taking over as my advisor and encouraging me to get outside my comfort zone to create a valuable project. Dr. Micah Russell is also instrumental in pushing me outside my comfort zone and being one of the first to believe I could finish this project so quickly. I want to thank Ashley Hom and Elia Gizzi for working with me to come up with the project we think is beneficial to their cause. I also want to thank all the people I interviewed for spotlights on the website, including Eli Smith, Nathan Seward, Dan Zadra, Catherine Bigley, Dr. Russell, and Ashley Hom. Finally, I'd like to thank the 611 students who worked on the Sage Grouse project, as well as Alicia Warshin for dedicating her time to me to revamp it. Thank you.
Heather. That was amazing. I think we have time for one or two questions from the audience on Zoom. Yeah, so Jess wants to know, um, because I have been involved with water restoration and interested in water restoration, what I found most interesting about diving in with the Beaver Believer Group. Sorry. Uh, I think one of the main takeaways I got from this is that uh, water restoration is a very changing process. It's always updating the um, different restoration methods are always being introduced. And talking to Ashley, who's been in the business for a while, 12 plus years, um, they never really talked about beavers as water restoration method. They never really talked about um, how beavers influence the land and they never generally put much emphasis on why it mattered that they were disappearing from a lot of waterways in the West. And um, what I found really interesting is that it took a single book, um, Eager, if you, any of you have heard about it, it's kind of about beavers in the, not just the West, but beavers on the landscape in general. And it took that single book to really light this fire in Ashley to bring beavers and restoration methods such as that to the Gunnison Valley. Yep. We have one online um, from, or, okay, we have a question online from Will Kiesel. He's asking, how did you go about finding resources for Spanish language translation and web development? Yeah, um, for Spanish uh, language translation specifically, I don't have too much work with that. My Spanish is very outdated, so that wouldn't be beneficial for anyone. Um, there are options for certain platforms to automatically switch from English to Spanish, but I know before that's ever published, the uh, Gunnison Valley Beaver Believer Groups will bring in a professional to actually make that translation. So you don't just have some random word on the website. Um, for resources on website development, there are actually tons of free courses on Coursera and just a bunch of Google searches bring up a lot of information, sometimes a little too much information, uh, but that's generally how I went about that. Thank you. Oops, Seth. If you could repeat the question, Heather, please. Yeah. So um, Sally wanted to know, because I'm working in communication now, if I will continue to do that in the future. And also, um, if I like the beaver or venison sage grass part of this project more. <laughs> so for the communication, I am definitely still working on it. As you can tell, I'm very nervous in front of you right now. Uh, I will continue to work on it, especially in my future career is going to be an integral part of any career that I take on is obviously talking to people <laughs> and communicating the science that we have so that people understand why we believe beavers and sage grass are important. Um, for the projects themselves, I'm sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> I love the sage grouse, um, but I believe learning about the beaver, um, especially because everyone generally knows what a beaver is, learning about um, all the different ways they're able to impact the environment and the great benefits they provide to us. I think learning that story and bringing it forward is really beneficial. Thank you. All right, I believe it's Janae now.
Hello. Okay. Uh, my name's Jenea, and this is the Majakali Monument, a Sister Cities project. Like a few other students have done yesterday, I'm going to spend today telling you a story. It starts with an organization called Sister Cities International, which I like to think of as basically a pen pal program for towns across the world from each other that you might not assume have things in common, but have more in common than you would think, and they can collaborate on those similar issues. It was started in 1956, and since then has grown over 2,100 of these pen pal partnerships around the world. Gunnison, Colorado, and our sister city, Majapali, India, were officially sister cities as of 2018. So in order for this relationship to work, there are some things that we need to have in common. With Gunnison and Majapali, we're both mountain communities, watersheds, we both have forests and abundant biodiversity. And with all of that ecology in both Gunnison and Majapali, the thing we also have in common is we both have a lot of environmental activism. Another thing that we have in common is that both of our economies are largely based on winter tourism, like skiing. So with all of that in common, students went to Majapali, India in 2018 and built this Sister Cities Park. It's basically meant as an area to meet your community members, talk about issues that your community might be facing, share knowledge, and overall just build community resiliency by getting to know your town. This was in 2018. I started the program in 2020. The Sister Cities Park still hadn't been built. So fast forward a couple years to 2020 when we get an invitation to also join the Living Chapel Project. This is an interfaith organization that brings people together of different faiths around sustainability by engaging them with these interactive art installations. You can kind of see in the background, that's the Living Chapel outside of the Vatican in Rome. And this is a living garden, another thing they set up around the world, similar to the Living Chapel, similar to the Sister Cities Park, meant to be an area where you can just engage with your community members, talk it out and build resiliency. So we're wanting to build the Sister Cities Park for a couple of years now. We're getting an invitation from the Living Chapel and they have these living gardens. We're starting to wonder, can these be the same park? Is it appropriate to integrate a spiritual conversation into our sister city relationship? And Majakali does have a very spiritual presence. They're, fam they're famous for the Chipko movement, which is a nonviolent environmental movement in the 1970s, which was largely led by women of faith. They would read Hindu texts at the protests and have their arms wrapped around trees to prevent logging. Chipko in Hindi actually means to hug. So it's literally named the tree hugger movement, basically. And before their economy was based on winter tourism, it was a lot of spiritual tourism. People would visit the temples all around Majakali and go for introspection as opposed to sightseeing. So students in 2018, they had kind of picked a campus as an area to build a sister cities park. Once we've determined that it is appropriate to integrate spirituality into sustainability, like our sister city Majapali has already done, we refined the location a little bit to meet the needs of both organizations, the Living Chapel and Sister Cities. This is behind the athletic fields by the Signal Peak Trailhead. You can see we picked an area that doesn't have much vegetation, so we're doing as little harm to the area as possible. So we picked out this trailhead by Signal Peak and we went to the mountain on a 20 degree day and we discussed our visions for integrating spirituality into sustainability for Gunnison. It was on the mountain that day that I learned that the Ku Klux Klan used to have meetings on that same mountain. This was heartbreaking to learn to say the least, but also invigorating because it gives us the opportunity to recreate a narrative on the land, retell the history, and also the opportunity, and I think the responsibility to restore the narrative of the Ute Mountain Ute who have already, before the KKK had meetings on Signal Peak, we're talking about the intersection of spirituality and sustainability. So we're feeling really excited to move forward with both of these two organizations when we do get the unfortunate news that the Vatican, which is a major partner of the Living Chapel, that they 
rescinded their support in same-sex unions. Apparently, when the Pope said that, it was a misquotation, a misunderstanding, and the Vatican let us know that their stance on same-sex unions is unchanged. I was really enamored with the Living Chapel when I first started working with them, and I really value the people I've gone to talk to with that organization, but ultimately I decided we didn't want to isolate any community members from feeling welcome at the Majapali Monument. So we're deciding not to work with the Living Chapel anymore, but what organization do we have in Gunnison that can lead the interfaith conversation? We know that they have this intersection in Majapali already. We also know that they have the foundation for the contemplation of nature, which is kind of their hub to lead this interfaith dialogue. What do we have in Gunnison to do that? We had nothing until me and two interns started a green faith circle on campus. It's the only interfaith org in the valley and their whole thing is that people of People of faith make up 80% of the general population. That's a thing that a lot of people have in common that we can use that as a base board to integrate our morals into sustainable practices. Beyond just people of faith, they also try to reach out to people of conscious. If people of faith are about 80% of the people in this room, I think people of conscious are 100% of people in this room. And I'm an optimist, so I think that ratio is pretty reflective in the general population as well. So again, this is a base word we can use to talk about sustainability. I'm really excited to have found Green Faith. I'm a little bit bummed about what happened, happened with the Living Chapel, but again, really ready to move forward when another bump in the road happens being the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, since the Sister Cities Park is on school land, on city property. We had access to those institutions, but the COVID response comes first, which I'm really grateful for because it meant that I could hang out with my cohort in person and that we're all here today. Um, so that leaves us like, where's my project now since we haven't been able to build the sister city park with COVID. That means this project is about storytelling a story of the good and bad of religious institutions. It's a project about spiritual exploration and creating an oral history of what we can learn from Majapali, what we can learn from the youth to integrate into our own intersection in the valley. And lastly, it's a project about cultural reanimation. Cultural animation is a phrase that was popularized by a theater in the UK where they would have really interactive shows where they would teach community members about crises in their communities and they would leave the theater with actionable items to address that crisis in real life. Cultural reanimation is a phrase that was introduced to me by Marcy Tallinder, who some of you might know as the founder of Venetov, a storytelling festival, festival in Crested Butte. And she described cultural reanimation as reminding people what they value, reminding people that their values may not align with the values we've been socialized to have and reminding people that they can transform their beliefs into action. So cultural animation, oral history, storytelling, these are my objectives that I achieved with interviews with spiritual leaders in the Valley where I talked about their belief systems, how it applies to sustainability, how we can integrate that into an interfaith dialogue in Gunnison and the purpose of these interviews was for me to get information from them, obviously, but also to give information to them about this project so that they can spread that into their wider communities and grow community support and community conversation for this project. Again, this was started in 2018, so continuity is very important to make sure that there's community commitment for this project moving forward. So the interviews and the transcriptions and analysis is available for future students who will be taking on this project. Another way that I've achieved continuity with the Majapahit Monument is by setting up Green Faith Circle at Western. We've gotten to connect students with each other, which a lot of them have been missing the opportunity to do the past couple of years. We've connected students to religious, oops, sorry, religious organizations in the Valley so that they can help them green their institutions, green their practices, like streamlining waste at festivals and events that they have, among other things. Um, so 
things didn't really go according to plan with my projects, but one of the things we learn the most in this program is to be adaptable in the face of climate change, a pandemic, the Vatican saying, never mind about that thing we said. You have to be adaptable. You have to get out into your communities and do what you can with whom you can. So I am really grateful for my community who has made this possible, especially Dr. Kate Clark. There she is, uh, who I've cried to very, very many times on the phone. And uh, Dr. John, who introduced this project to me to begin with. Councilman Gelwix, who has offered a lot of advice on the government side of things and has offered me a lot of patience in general. Jeff Irwin, who has offered artistic advice about building the monument and so many people, but really anyone who has engaged in vulnerable conversation with me, thank you. I will take questions. <laughs> Yeah, the question was what I see as the role of green faith with the monument and also just the spiritual dialogue in Gunnison. Um, green faith, originally, like when we chose to start green faith, a big point of that for me was to make sure that there was some sort of constant support for the monument. This is a club that will be on campus indefinitely. There will always be students at green faith ready to host events at the monument as it's getting built to paint and plant the gardens and get hands-on community engagement. So a big role of Green Faith for me is to have a group of people ready and excited to take care of the Majapali monument when it's built. And also just, again, greening religious institutions. So we talked to, um, a Jewish temple where they have an event coming up in August where they produce so much trash and they don't really know how to not do that. So Green Faith volunteers will be helping them organize that. Uh, things like that and just having that support in the community. Something that really, really connected with me and I've been thinking a lot about over, like since I read it is If Women Rose Rooted by Sharon Blackie. Some of you might know we read in a creative writing class and it's reflective of my conversation with Marcy as well when I interviewed her because we were talking about how the treatment of the environment is mirrored to the treatment of women. And that's just been something I've been thinking about growing this project working with a beautiful team of women and it, it was very personal because it talks about like the heroine's journey and a lot of us might want to retreat and live off grid we're like i want to be a farmer i don't want to be on social media but then the heroine always feels called back to society because how are you going to change anything from your farm over there so yeah if women rose rooted by sharon blackie has been really uh, important to me the past year Thank you for that question. We have another question on Zoom. Landon Schaller is saying, what an amazing project, Jenea. Thank you for taking it on. How might someone continue to support this project and get word out about its value in the community? Thank you for that question. Um, you can email me, <laughs> jenea.blair at western.edu uh, or Yahoo for when that email eventually goes away. Um, Joy in Green Faith, they're going to be doing a lot of that and 
I'm still working on securing a MEM student to take this on in the future. So hopefully I can pass on that email um, to Landon as well. Yeah, I'm still kind of drawing with Jeff Aaron, my community sponsor, but it'll be similar to the monument that they have in Majakali, open air, a little bit of a, like a shaded cover as well, because it gets really sunny back there. And uh, we're kind of drawing up an art installation that mirrors like the water cycle to represent our relationship as watershed communities. So it'll be behind the athletic field. So we get to look out to the mountains, hear the water trickling from this uh, like steel, stru steel structure we're kind of working on. Um, yeah, people who I've talked to about, we've talked about this mine it being generational. Like, yes, people will come here to talk about spirituality. Yes, Green Faith will lead events there to like run that dialogue, but it'll also be people on the trail system just stopping for a rest. It'll be people like losing their keys. It'll be students doing deviant behaviors back there. And all of that is part of uh, like building the community at the Montecali Monument. Thank you so much, Janaya. That's all the time we have now for questions. Thank you. Uh, next up is Eileen. Thank you, Janaya. All right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Eileen McCafferty. I'm a distance student in the MEM from New York, and my project is using deliberative dialogue to promote coexistence. So while my project focuses on something extremely prevalent to the Colorado landscape right now, the CPW wolf reintroduction, I'd really like you to think about what I'm explaining to you throughout, because this is something that I believe represents that we need to tackle all of our international and national social issues in order to create a better world to live in. So um, growing up, I was in love with wolves, uh, but then I found out that the left side of my brain was not as strong, the math and science portion. So being a wolf biologist was not in my cards. Um, so I found the human wildlife conflict and through my time at Western and speaking with Dr. Young, I found out about the human wildlife conflict, which is negative interactions between humans and wildlife that results in the loss of property, the loss of life, and the loss of livelihood. So for hundreds of years, we found that wolves were undesirable to live with. We couldn't stand being on the landscape with another hunter. It hurt our egos. It was not conducive for productivity. So we created these fear-fueled folklores to make them seem super scary. The big bad wolf, the three little pigs, you name it. Um, so this mentality promoted slaughter campaigns. And for the last couple of hundred years, we've done nothing but that. We've killed them off, we've received bounties for it. And in the lower 48 states, wolves were removed from about 96% of their regular range minus certain portions of the Great Lakes states. So at first we were like, cool, sweet relief, no more wolves, we can thrive. Um, but that actually came with some pretty significant environmental impacts. Uh, we found that the ecosystem was shifting towards a less healthy range. Uh, ungulate populations were left unchecked. They were overgrazing. Um, and then in 1995, the Yellowstone National Park decided to bring the wolf back. Through, you know, reintroduction, they found that the ecosystem was beginning to thrive again. Um, and while that was all great and good, that also caused a lot of human to human controversy. Um, people outside of the park were not in favor of this because wolves don't respect man-made borders, such as Yellowstone National Park. Um, they're going to go where they want. And people felt that their livelihood was at stake, their safety was at stake. 
So it became a very controversial issue, issue. Now this brings me to Colorado. So as many of you know, in 2020, November, Colorado passed Proposition 114, which was the Gray Wolf Reintroduction Initiative that was asking the CPW to reintroduce wolves, maintain their habitat, population size, et cetera. Um, the vote barely passed. It was 1.8% out of 64 counties in Colorado, only 13 of them were predominantly yes votes. However, the counties that voted yes were mostly the ones that have the big urban areas such as Boulder, Denver, Colorado Springs. This began to showcase in Colorado that human mentality divide where we can't agree on something. So as this map shows, pointer, there we go. All right, so these lighter green counties that are highlighted, those are the ones that voted yes, right? However, as many of you know, right along here is where the Rocky Mountains are, give or take. Um, now this is a problem because most people in the front range were who voted this in, but where do you think that they're coming into? The Western Slope. It has not been fully decided where they're coming into, where they're gonna be released, but it is somewhere on this side of the state. And this is problematic because a lot of the ranching communities and uh, recreational communities kind of utilize this area, the public lands, what have you. So it's, it's caused a huge, huge rift between people. So this is where I come in. My project started off with education. I wanted to know more about the wolf. What was the truth? Were they these human killing machines or were they the saviors of every ecosystem ever? And then I wanted to know more information about what other people thought. So I started researching, you know, what was done in Yellowstone National Park? What did the Great Lakes, Great Lakes states do as far as recolonization? And then I started having conversations with people. I talked to people in Europe. I talked to people in Wyoming, Alaska, Michigan, Wisconsin, everywhere that wolves live, obviously. And then I'm using those three to create methods of deliberation. And then in turn, I hope, at least in some form, that I can promote collaboration between people. So one of the first things I'd like to mention is Dr. Melanie Armstrong, shout out. She gave me and my co-fellowship person, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Boom, there we go. She gave me and Mia McNeil, my partner in fellowship, the Moving from Forms to Action Fellowship. Um, this was through the Colorado Alliance for Environmental Education. And what it looked at is how deliberative forms and educational tools promote impact through people? Or is it just spewing a bunch of information and nobody takes any steps towards action to collaborate? Or are there ways to make it more engaging and moves people towards you know, action? So this is Katie Nevin. She was the woman who kind of helped us along with this. She's from the CAWE. So what we did was me and I talked to Erin Mercado from the MCC. Um, we had an engagement event at uh, the MCC for two days. We talked to a lot of the students there to kind of gauge what their opinion on about the wolf, what your, their opinion was on the wolf, wolf reintroduction. And then what we did next was Dr. Derek Hardwell, Dr. Hardwell. We, uh, we spoke to his ENVS 100 class and created a mock forum for his students so that we could test our deliberation skills. And this kind of set me on my path to create three deliverables for my project. So in fall of 2020, uh, me and 10 other students, we started off this ArcGIS database. It started off with just five states in the West, Idaho, Montana, Washington, Oregon, and Wyoming. Um, and we were comparing management plans throughout these states. With their blessing, I was able to move on with this project and use it as a resource. So as you can see, it's kind of blurry, I apologize. But I have different pinpoints on the map, and this kind of shows you can go into this location finder and see what the management plan is for each of these areas. Again, we have Europe, I have a place in Canada, and then all wolf inhabited states in the United States. It gives management plans, it gives their hunting and harvesting practices, it gives ethics, it gives the economic flow that goes into wolf management plans. 
um, as well as the livestock information, what the reimbursement process is, what predation rates are, et cetera. So then we come to where this ArcGIS database is gonna live. So my community organization sponsor was the Center for Public Lands. Um, I am now working on creating a web page on there that the database will be implemented into. And with help from Tobias Nickel, for me MEM alum, um, I have been creating this informational web page. This kind of gives the misinformation on all sides, how wolves are not this man killing machine, how they're not the absolute only savior of the ecosystem, but it really gives the hard science of it all. Um, and it also gives ways to have productive deliberative forums. And then the last thing is that it will showcase all the recent and important information for Colorado stakeholders to have as far as this reintroduction is concerned. Then the final and most important thing that I have been working on, this is just a prototype right now, um, is called an environmental issues forum guide. And it is basically what people are going to take and sit down at the table with. They're gonna deliberate, they're gonna try to agree on some form of action. I called it the thing about wolves is because every single person that I have interviewed, that is one of the first things that they state. You know, the thing about wolves is, so what this does is it provides stakeholders and forum attendees three or four different options. And you know, if one person is pro-wolf and one person is anti, so an option one, where am I not budging? Will I not compromise on this? But option B, I might be giving a little wiggle room. Option three, I don't really care what happens with that. And I'm still in the process of you know developing this. So I don't fully have it all together yet, but we're coming along. But this is the main thing that I wanna to give to Colorado stakeholders is, hey, there are ways to agree and there are ways to leave the table. Even if you're still on opposite ends, you can walk away together just knowing that you collaborated and compromised. So no matter where your stance is on wolves, beavers, spirituality, your voice and your opinion are absolutely valid. I want to use and help these tools become how we create collaboration. And it's not even just about environmental issues, race issues, women issues, sex issues, all issues that you can think of right now. I mean, just look at any newspaper and you will see we have a lot of problems. We need, <laughs> we do, <laughs> let's be honest. We need to create something that's going to help us move forward. And if we don't, we're, we're kind of just kicking ourselves in the ass and we're not gonna move forward with anything. So I'd like to say a couple thanks for starters to my ENVS 608 group for allowing me to continue on with this project. Um, I'd like to say thank you to Aaron Mercado of the MCC, Derek Harwell from ENVS 100, uh, my partner in fellowship, Mia McNeil. I don't know if you're in the room or not, probably not, but um, for working on me with such a time crunch on this project. Um, next to all of the U.S. Gunnison and international wolf community members that I've interviewed and given your time and effort to, thank you so much if you are here and listening. I appreciate that. Um, next to Tobias Nickel for in his first week of being with the CPL, sat down with me for like an hour to try to figure out how I can best utilize a web page to promote my message. Um, of course, to Dr. Melanie Armstrong for just believing in me and also being in one of probably your most intense years as a professional and professor here at Western, like intern deem and you're just kicking butt all over the place. So I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, big round of applause. And at last, but obviously the most important is Dr. Jesse Young. I'm going to choke up a little bit. I'm so sorry. Um, because of you for telling me that you were not wrong in accepting my application to Western and being on the phone with me when I cried a few times, um, your kindness has just gone leaps and bounds and I will never forget this. So thank you so much. Um, and then the final thing that I'd like to close with, and I'm going to read it off my phone because it's really important that I don't mess up the wording. Um, I'd like to start off, or I'd like to finish with a poem that I started off my, um, one of my first projects at MEM, The Story of Us, Story of Now, to talk about 
who we are, who our community is, and what we see for the future. Okay. Turning to One Another, a poem by Margaret J. Wheatley. There is no greater power than a community discovering what it cares about. Ask what's possible, not what's wrong, and keep asking. Notice what you care about. Assume that many others share your dreams. Be brave enough to start a conversation that matters. Talk to people you know, talk to people you don't know, and talk to people you never talk to. Be intrigued by the differences you hear. Expect to be surprised. Treasure. Sorry. Acknowledge that everyone is an expert about something. Know that creative solutions come from real connections. Remember, you don't feel fear people whose stories you know. Real listening always brings people closer together. Trust that meaningful conversations can change your world. Rely on human goodness and stay together. Thank you so much. Any questions? Molly. That I was. So Molly's question was that being a distance student and I'm working on something that is in 2,000 miles away from me, um, what those challenges were. Um, did I get your question correct? No. Yeah. So uh, number one, just the cultural humility of it all, recognizing that like, who am I from suburban New York trying to be like, hey, Colorado, you guys should get along. Like, it's okay. That was really hard because I obviously have my opinion on the subject, but it's not something that's impacting me directly. Um, I think the challenge was not being here and not being able to like face to face engage with members of the community. It was a bunch of phone calls or Zoom calls, which, you know, those work out, but they're not the same. Like, I can't just run into people at the laundromat like I did during the intensive and just like poke their brain secretly, them not knowing what I'm actually doing, being like, hey, I'm from New York and I hear Colorado's bringing back wolves. Like, how do you feel about that? So that was a little hard. I did that during the first, the second intensive, but that that I think was the biggest challenge is not being here, and also you know recognizing that I don't have a right to say which way something should go. So yeah. We have a question from um, an attendee at the distance. They said, "Really excellent work. How do you foresee someone else taking your process?" process and products and applying it to a different topic as in what will they need to do okay so the question was taking what oh, i've you done you don't have to repeat it so oh okay so. sorry thank you all right cool um so basically the process was like hardcore educating myself on the issue and you know trying to make sure that like i covered all bases and sometimes i'd forget something um, educating myself on where the science was and then where the politics were and what the difference was and then kind of going into having the conversations with people researching who was involved in the anti-wolf campaign campaigns and the pro-wolf campaigns who the scientists are um, and then you know once you kind of have those conversations and like take notes on what people are concerned about or what they feel is the concern if wolves weren't brought back um, to kind of use that to create those options for the environmental issues guide. And, you know, just because I write this one, uh, you know, once I finish in the next couple of months, that doesn't mean that it's going to be the end all be all. There might be something else that somebody wants to switch in and out. You know, this is, this is just to get the conversation and the action rolling. So it's, yeah. Education, really. Great, thank you. Actually. 
Thank you. I love you. Yeah, so the next couple of months, I'm going to be finishing it up. Um, have to take one of those little incompletes. Um, so handy if you need it. But uh, so it's just going to be finishing up those. Uh, if somebody, one of the first years, about to be second years, would like to collaborate on creating more of it, um, I'd be down to pass it along. Um, but I think Dr. Armstrong had mentioned this once or twice, but publishing on a national forum, the issues guide, so that you know people are able to see what the issues guide is and how it can deliberate something that's like really, really tricky and controversial, so. Thank you so much, Eileen. That's all the time we have now for questions. Let's bring up the full panel. Repeat the question, please, for the people on Zoom. Um, so the question was, as far as not having six or seven or eight months to kind of work on something like this, where does the short-term communication kind of come into play? Um, and effective techniques. For my project personally, like it was just about again seeing people at the laundromat when I was here, or talking to my cohort and just kind of picking their brain about it. And, being able to do it in like a really calm manner and not being like, oh, we're yelling because we don't agree and no one's listening. So that's, yeah, that's how I handled it. Uh, something I think about is just uh, giving people the benefit of the doubt. We make a lot of assumptions about people, either from what like they look like, what we assume their political party is, and just, being kind in those short interactions that you have with people. Um, I don't specifically do like the restoration work, but there are work days and that's where random, not random volunteers, but volunteers go out to the site and they do the restoration work. And a large part of that work day is the education, the communication, being able to talk to the public land managers that are doing the restoration like they're all out there they're all willing to talk to you and I think the website um, most people don't spend hours looking at any website they're like oh I want to know what's on this page and then I'm going to go somewhere else uh, so I think even having the website as a platform is a short form of communication because I don't think anyone really goes through every single word of every single website they go on Uh, I think as the human representative, just <laughs> viewing ourselves as equals to the beaver and the wolf and things that, and like I was kind of saying in my pre presentation about the treatment of earth and animals is kind of reflective of the treatment of women. So just thinking about that, how, how would you 
want to treat your community of beavers, your community of wolves. Uh, the question was how, with humans, beavers, and wolves being keystone species, if us collaborating, we figured out ways to, like how that reflects on coexisting between different species. Pans and then they're gone. So the question was, do we have any memorable interview experiences that we'd be willing to share? And I got to meet Doug Smith. He is a wolf biologist in Yellowstone. He was the key person in the wolf reintroduction in the 90s. And, you know, at first I was like getting ready for this interview and my partner came with me and I was like freaking out. I was like, he's going to think that I'm dumb. He's barely going to answer my questions, blah, blah. And I sat down and I talked to him and I would ask him the first question. He went on for like 10 minutes, like really giving me all this information. And a lot of it was more the science part of it and a little bit of the controversy. But then at the end, you know, I kind of explained to him where I was heading with my project. This was back in August before I like really fine tuned it. And he's sitting at his desk and he just looks up at me and he was just like, you know, what you're doing is like really important. And I think it's amazing what you're doing. And I was like, <gasps> Doug Smith, he, he's like been a role model of mine. So I, I fangirled really hard and kind of wanted to cry when that happened. But yeah, so that was awesome. I had a bit of a fangirl moment with Marcy. Um, she is very open about being a crone, which is like an archetype of an old sage woman. woman. And we like look down on aging. We like don't respect elders in general. So her being very open about, yes, I am a crone. Yes, I am here to like give you advice and coach you. Because I started getting like emotional during that interview as well. When we were talking about the thing with nature reflecting women, and I I look forward to being a crone one day. So. <laughs> Hi, uh, so I talked to Ashley, uh, it's about 3 p.m. in the afternoon. She'd been on meetings all day, skip lunch. Uh, she's going a little crazy staring at the screen, so she's a little loopy. Uh, but she was very easy to talk to. She's very enthusiastic about the reintroduction of beavers and the new work that's being done. And she was very open about the fact that it was never really part of her journey in the last 12 years. And she was really, really excited about getting involved. And that really made me excited to do these interviews and give them something that other people could look at in the future. Thank you all for sharing your stories with us. I want to thank this group for not only being, the word that was coming to my mind was, was catalyst and thinking about the ways that all of your projects are bringing these bigger conversations to the, to the table and how important that is. So on behalf of all of us who care about beavers and wolves and humans, I think, um, thank you for, for that work. And I can say from my perspective and from the perspective of your faculty that we are very glad that we admitted all of you into the program <laughs> and that you absolutely deserve to be right here on this stage today. So it's my pleasure now to introduce to this community recipients of the Master's of Environmental Management degree. Heather Reineking, please stand. Jenea Blair, congratulations. Nyleen McCafferty, please stand. Congratulations to all of you. <laughs> 